Well, good evening, good people. Mark Holmes here, and as always, I want to say thank you all for watching, commenting, subscribing, and being part of Joe Boo Sports Report, as well as Joe Boo's day job, which actually turns into my night job, too. Man, it's been a long, long weekend, but let, let me get to what I want to talk about here. You know, um, the talking heads, of course, have been killing Mike McCarthy and things, and they keep swearing that Kellen Moore was the reason why the Cowboys were able to do things and that Mike McCarthy just fell off the saddle truck. That Mike McCarthy is an idiot. That, that's basically what they, they're trying to get you to buy into. Sorry, I'm adjusting the camera. It's broadcast media. Now, we've heard now a little bit more about the Kellen Moore, uh, Mike McCarthy situation where they didn't actually get along as well as what we were kind of led on to believe that there was actually a lot of infighting between the two of them and things and not seeing well. And see, I understand what Mike McCarthy had to do. Mike McCarthy couldn't come in and just like overrule Kellen Moore because Kellen Moore was the, you know, favorite son, or the, the Jason Garrett replacement. And had Mike McCarthy come in and just basically try and took over, if it failed or any time it didn't go right, he was going to be the fall guy. So he played it the right way. He bought his time, you know, bought his time and let Kellen Moore do Kellen Moore and things. And when it failed, then Jerry Jones comes to him and says, what do we need to do differently? And that's how he played it, and he played it perfectly. That's why now he's got full autonomy. That's why he got Brian Schottenheimer. And I will say, Brian Schottenheimer is the anti-Kellen Moore. See, observations from last year at training camp. You know, I was there, my buddy Law Nation, I wish I was there this year. Uh, just couldn't do it this year. And the thing is, it's like this. You go for a week, you get three practices. You're going to spend a couple thousand dollars for a couple of practices, because that's what it really amounts to by the time you pay for the plane trip, pay for the hotel rooms for, for those nights and everything else. But be that as it may. Be that as it may. Kellen Moore, when he, he talks, he's not really that engaging. And what you notice when he is in training camp, it's like you see Dan Quinn, who's out there running around with the guys. You know, he's jumping in at nose tackle and stuff. You know, he's pumping the guys up. You know, you see the camaraderie between the coach and the dynamic and the players that they buy into what he's doing. You don't see that with Kellen Moore. Kellen Moore is kind of usually by himself or he's over there talking to Dak. He's got this notebook. And it's not engaging. You, you know, it's kind of one of those things that, you know, if he was a lecturer, you feel like you're going to fall asleep. I can listen to Brian Schottenheimer all day. And here's where you understand the dynamic between Brian Schottenheimer and Mike McCarthy, where as opposed to Mike McCarthy, you know, going through and Kellen, don't do this, Kellen, don't do that, and biting his tongue, he now has a guy who's going to work with him in real time. And I will say that at least on paper, what he has done by getting the analytics people and by surrounding himself by people who are like-minded that hopefully will be working in the same direction, you're going to get a better result. And it hit me thinking about, and I pointed out before, when you look at the Super Bowl winning Packers team, Aaron Rodgers wasn't doing all of the things that he's doing you know, later on in his career. You look at the team, the way it was constructed, they had a lot of wide receivers, a lot of great wide receivers. They were deep. I mean, they had, you know, their four starting wide receivers, guys like Greg Jennings. And tight ends, they had a lot of tight ends. Running backs, they didn't have big, you know, I think that Eddie Lacy was like the big back. But the Super Bowl year, I think he only had like 700 yards. They had running back by committee. So it wasn't that they had just one big playmaker at any of the positions, at tight end, at wide receiver, at running back. It was a group of guys that death by a thousand cuts. I'm going to get you know 700 yards from this receiver and 900 yards from this receiver and 600 from that one. And if you think about the Cowboys, Dak Prescott's rookie year, when you had Cole Beasley and Des Bryant and Terrence, um, Terrence Williams, everybody, and, and even Jason Witten, <clears throat> everybody was like between like 600 and 1,000 yards. 
and they were all collectively. They weren't pro bowlers, but they were all guys that were catching stuff. So it wasn't one guy. If you stop one guy, there's another guy who's going to be able to pick up the slack. And that's ultimately what I think Mike McCarthy's trying to do. But I want you to listen for a couple minutes of this interview with Brian Schottenheimer. And tell me if I'm wrong about listening to him and how you feel. He, he actually gives you some confidence and understanding that Brian Schottenheimer is like um, some of your great coaches, uh, like Kyle Shanahan, who, of course, coached under his dad. You know, Brian Schottenheimer, Marty Schottenheimer's father, who, of course, believed in running the damn football, beating the hell out of you in great defense. I how do you describe your role a little bit in that it's, again, it's offensive coordinator, but you're not calling the plays? And how, does, how do you adapt that role versus what you did before? Just kind of your interactions with Mike, you know, daily to kind of set all that up and make this work? Well, number one, I've never done it before, but I think the good thing for me, number and for Mike, is having been the guy that's called plays for 14 years, I know what that guy wants. So I can work with the staff, I can work with the players of – helping set the table for Mike to feel good about the game plan, for the adjustments, the things we want to do during the week, mm -hmm. maybe players to attack, players to neutralize. So I almost look at it like, okay, yeah, he's dialing them up. But again, I know when I was sitting in that seat, the things I want to know. My relationship with Mike is such that he and I can have great conversations, challenge each other, talk about different things. I'm certainly not uh, a yes man. I'm going to you know, tell him what... Uh, my thoughts are, and certainly whatever his decision is, is final, and uh, we'll make that go. But if 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 Mike feels good on game day, if Dak feels good on game day, then that's good for the Dallas Cowboys. And so uh, it's my job kind of to, uh, along with the staff, to set that up and uh, do the things we need to do during the prep where he feels really good going into the game. And then Sunday changes a little bit, right? Because Sunday, my job's going to be to help him throughout the process uh, adapt, adjust based on what the defense is doing, um, help him with some ideas and thoughts um, in between series, as you know. Uh, but there's so much that goes into calling a game. There's feedback from the staff. There's feedback from the players. Um, and so, again, I can help him sift through that information like I, like I wanted when I, was, when I was calling the plays. I haven't decided that yet. We might try it both ways. See, and that's key. See, what that is is, is – He's the right-hand man, so that way he can be you know, like the hand of the king. In fact, that's what we're going to call Brian Schottenheimer, the hand of the king. Because, see, that's where he can advise, Mike, you don't want to do that. Here's how it can go if you do this and how you do that. So we're going to call Brian Schottenheimer the hand of the king. And that's where he wants to make sure the king feels good about what he's doing. Gives him all the information in real time to help make that decision. There's another point here. I think it's the next one. Uh, with uh, Tony Pollard and his moving mm -hmm. into this offense, what does that do for him and how much work he's getting? Or is it just a, he's good beyond the ankle injury, just as a guy that's never been that 300 carry season guy? Yeah, we're aware of it. He's not ever going to do that. Right though. now, they're obviously all being talked about in the media, right? Mm -hmm. the, what's the value? Hey, you know. Tony, Tony is ready for this opportunity. There's no question about it. It's awesome to have him back out there. You guys have seen the mm -hmm. talent. Um, I'm excited about the person. I mean, you talk about a guy that it's so cool to see back out here practicing after a, a tough injury like that. Um, he's certainly ready for that role. Mm -hmm. um, we'll be smart as we build him up, just like with all the guys trying to ramp him up, get a feel for things that we're doing, and that allows us to evaluate some of the younger backs. Malik and Deuce and guys like that, but... Uh, Ronald Jones, don't forget I don't, Ronald. I don't undervalue the running back position at all. I mean, some of the best teams we had with the Jets, right? You had three backs. You had LaDainian, Sean Green, you had Thomas Jones, Leon Watt. I mean, it requires people because it's such a physical position that they play. And that's why, along with getting Tony his work, we got to get all those guys below him those same opportunities. Malik, Rico, uh, Rojo, Deuce. Uh, and that's the cool thing is you have to look for those in preseason because the way we practice now is a little bit different. 
that this is actually a great interview, and I encourage you to watch the whole thing on DallasCowboys.com. But see, that gives you a window into the soul, and that's where, when I first watched that, it's like, yeah, that's exactly what Green Bay did. And they had a great defense. They ended up distributing the ball all over the place. They controlled the clock. And they didn't rely on just one guy, because if one guy you're relying on goes down, you're screwed. So I definitely enjoyed that, and I love the hand of the king. I'm Mark Holmes, and well, i got to go plaster these walls, and it's... I don't know, it's about 9 o'clock at night. The sun's going down. But I need to get this wall plastered before I go. Peace.